So we are reading Far Journeys by Robert Monroe. We are on page eight of the book and page 10 of the PDF. A psychologist friend back in the early days was skeptical of this drug allergy. Further, he was interested in what the effects of what are now called entertainment drugs would be on my type of personal and physical makeup. We tried laboratory quality mescaline and LSD on my system. Nothing happened. So another so, item. So what was happening over here? We've had this experience when people have gone into the excursion workshop also. Sometimes people have skin eruptions and we've had this when people just join the meditation also. So if there's a lot of toxicity or something needs to be cleared in the system, many times a rash comes up. Okay, that's one of the ways of the body's detoxifying itself. So they thought that it was because of a chemically induced, induced thing. And when they tried other chemicals, nothing happened. So this was something because of that altered state of consciousness that he was going into. Another item. I asked a non-physical friend if I had been in a physical life existence in the recent past. It was one of the few clear verbal answers that I received. Your last human life was spent as a monk in a monastery in Kohoskon, Pennsylvania. I looked at the map of Pennsylvania and there was no Kohoskon indicated. I knew there was a Kohoskon in Ohio because I had lived in the state. Therefore, I asked again to be sure that the state was right. It was Pennsylvania. I didn't give it much thought because I personally am not deeply interested in who I was, if I was. I mentioned the event to a Catholic Monsignor friend and he offered to look it up in his records. Some weeks later, he called to say that really he was a monastery in a place called Kohoskon, Pennsylvania. He thought it would be interesting to drive up there some weekend and see if I responded to any memories, perhaps someday. Item, the money pants pocket. For years, I have kept this as a closet secret because no one believes it. I have shown it to my wife, Nancy, and she is still skeptical. It seems that if I leave a certain pair of pants hung in the bedroom closet, Rates paper money, real money, not new and crisp, usually fairly well worn. It is never a great amount. The maximum I have ever found in the pocket is $11. Usually there will be only two, three or four dollars. Time does not seem to be a factor. I can ignore it for a week and there will be perhaps three dollars. I may not go near it for three months and there may be only $6. There seems to be no particular format for the generation or the amount of money. I can take the pans to the cleaners and return them to the closet in their plastic bag. It makes no difference. We have theorized that I may walk in my sleep and insert money in my pants pocket. The unopened plastic bag dispelled that idea. One rationale is that it is an ongoing result of a very urgent need for a few dollars back in my teenage period. Some part of my system still remembers that urgent need and attempts to provide for it. Too bad that when you reach another stage in life, five or six or eleven dollars does not go very far. Very few people really believe it and I don't blame them. I wouldn't if it had, didn't happen to me. So now, in the previous paragraph, he talks about getting a message in that altered state of consciousness. And when he came back to look for it, although it was not there in present time, it must have been there in medieval time or some other time, right? So it turned out to be true. Now, the other thing is that when you have a real desire for manifesting something, the universe also works for you. So what he's saying over here, and there's a story coming up, where because he really desired that money, the universe is constantly still providing for that money. 
Now, there are many of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, so-called gurus, etc., who have this ability that they'll suddenly pluck something and put it out and give it to you. Now, there are two ways of doing that. One is man manipulating matter and converting air or something else into something, converting item A into item B. The other is that these people have control over some kind of a spirit who will go and get it from somewhere else. Okay, There are two kinds of ways in which this kind of manifestation can take place. Now, when a spirit goes and gets it, you always have to return something back. But when you are manipulating matter, then it becomes a little different thing altogether. Baba says that the, he met this one uh, sadhu somewhere in Rishikesh who could, you know, just bring rasgullas out of the air or laddus out of the air and give it to you. And then you could have it as prashant. So, so there are various kinds of people who can actually do this. Maya, your voice got cut after you said Papa says. Okay. Baba says that he met this sadhu somewhere in Rishikesh who could actually just use his hands and create rasgullas or laddus out of the air and give it to you. And you could actually eat it. Baba means my father, okay. I too. In our house at Whistlefield Farm, there was a screen porch of the living room. To get to the porch, one had to go through two double doors and down a series of flagstone steps that led to the porch at a lower level. These steps were quite steep, the difference in floor height being approximately four feet. One morning, with my arms full of books and papers, I walked out of the entrance to the porch and stumbled. My left foot crossed over in front of my right and I dove headlong in the direction of the flagstone floor of the porch. As I fell, I was unable to get my arms out in front of me. I remember thinking, well, this will certainly end up with a fractured skull and a broken neck. About six inches from the floor, my fall was suddenly arrested and I landed on my head and shoulders very lightly on the flagstone floor, no heavier than if I had simply put my head down very carefully. The rest of my body then draped down afterward, drifting as gently as a feather. I lay there for a moment wondering what had happened. I felt my head and my shoulders and there was no pain, no mark, no bruise, nothing. I stood up, picked up my books and papers, looked at the place from where I had fallen and tried to figure some answer. Something had cushioned my fall, but I certainly was not consciously aware of what it was. Okay. So now what happened? Someone actually cushioned the fall. I remember one incident in school we used to have our, uh, uh, the infirmary, which was about, about 10 flights of steps up. They used to go one after the other. And it was a real steep climb into the infirmary. And I remember one of my friends, he actually slipped. And he was right on the top of it. And he said, I was falling. And someone actually held me and pulled me back. Okay. So these kind of incidents happen a lot. You will suddenly get pulled back. Or suddenly someone will stop you. These kinds of things happen to a lot of people. There's a lot of uh, stories about these kind of things. It happened to my cousin, Chintu. Yeah, what she happened? fell from the first floor veranda. And we all, everybody went running down to the lawn because there was no other way. And she said that it was as if Bhagwanji came and he gave me his hands and I landed on that. Yeah. So that is what she saw. So many people actually experience this. Some months later, in the middle of winter, a similar event took place. I was walking down the front steps, which had been reportedly cleaned after a snow, slipped and started to fall. This time, I was not quite so surprised. Sorry.
learned the when right. I again landed very lightly. There have been only two such events, and I don't think I will deliberately try to fall experimentally. Just another one of those as yet unexplained moments. Item. One of the more puzzling events took place as a result of a very direct communication, or so it seemed. Early one morning in the mid-70s, after three o'clock to be exact, I went through my customary lazy man's way of rolling out of my body. Almost immediately, I was accosted by a vaguely formed individual who gave me this very specific instruction. Okay, so now what, what is he saying over here? This was his way of getting out of the body. Okay, so I went through my customary lazy man's way of rolling out of the body. So those of you who've done the gateway voyage, there's an exercise called rolling, rolling, okay, where you actually roll out of your body. He's talking about that method of getting out of the body. Mr. Monroe, be at Eagle Hill at 7 a.m. on July 4th. Surprised, I asked for a repeat of the instruction. It came exactly the same. Mr. Monroe, be at Eagle Hill at 7 a.m. on July 4th. Before I had a chance to ask why or what it was all about, the form faded and disappeared. I then rolled back into my body and sat up and wrote it down very carefully. The next night, when I performed the same act, almost immediately the form was there again with the same message. It was very definite, almost a command. And again, the figure faded before I had the chance to query further. I tried the third night to see if it replicated again, but there was no response. What was so impressive about it was that the instruction was very clear and it was repeated exactly the second night. Most important, they actually called me by name. So this is clear or this kind of situation, right? You can hear words very clearly, even in 3D consciousness, when we are awake like this, and you can actually hear the voice telling you something many times. This, of course, he was in an out-of-body state and there was a communication which came directly in the out-of-body state of consciousness. This instruction elicited a great deal of curiosity from me and those of my friends and family to whom I related it. We speculated in many ways about it, but the big question was, where is Eagle Hill? It was about April when the instruction was given and there seemed to be plenty of time to find out what the message meant. But try as we might, we could not find any place called Eagle Hill. After a few weeks, I more or less forgot about the idea. An event changed all that. While visiting friends several hundred miles from home, we were having dinner out on the patio of their house. My host had a radio receiver that automatically scanned various frequencies such as police, fire, and so on. We were sitting there chatting when suddenly over the radio came someone saying, Eagle Hill. It jarred my attention immediately. I excitedly asked my host what the radio was tuned to. He replied that it was the FAA aircraft channel for instructions to and from aircraft. I waited eagerly for something more on the radio. My host asked curiously, what was so important? Needless to say, I didn't feel that I could tell him. A couple of minutes later, the radio came to life loudly and clearly. This is United 351 over Eagle Hill at 12,000 feet. The next day, after a long drive home, I went to the FAA facility at our local airport and asked the FAA man where Eagle Hill was. He replied instantly, that it was a holding point in a neighboring state, a radio marker beacon. He showed it to me on the airway sectional map and sure enough, 
There it was, Eagle Hill. There evidently was some type of small village by that name, although it did not show on any of the road maps we had. This put a whole new prospect on the message. Therefore, on the July, afternoon of July 3rd, I left home for the long drive over to Eagle Hill. I drove into the small town nearest to the supposed site, checked into a local motel, had a casual dinner and went to bed early. At exactly seven the next morning, I drove into the crossroads called Eagle Hill. It consisted of two or three houses, a garage and a store, all situated around a small country crossroads. Not a very impressive place, to say the least. It looked like it had not changed in the last 30 or 40 years. I pulled over to the side and stopped the car. Several local citizens sitting outside the garage looked at me curiously as I sat and waited. I waited for over an hour and nothing happened. No one approached me. I didn't feel anything except first excitement and then disappointment. Finally, sometime after eight o'clock, under curious stares, I started the car, car and drove up through Eagle Hill into the countryside beyond. I drove about two miles further and there was nothing but farms. I returned to the crossroads and turned west and drove several miles. Again, nothing different. So, no one signaled me, nothing except country and farms. I turned around and drove east. It was all the same. I returned to my post at the crossroads, sat in the car and waited. When it got to be 12 o'clock, I decided that it had been all been an illusion, returned to the motel, checked out and had lunch. It was either the wrong Eagle Hill or I understood it wrong, misinterpreted, or it was all a hoax or a dream. So again... Now, whenever we get messages in these altered states, we have to have a language. We have to understand what is being meant by what is being told to us. Okay, so it comes in the next paragraph. After much contemplation, I decide, finally decided where my mistake was. The invitation or request was not that I go to Eagle Hill physically, it was that I be there in an out-of-body state. What the invitation did not take into account was how difficult it is for me to go directly to a specific place rather than a person. So now, up to now, in his out-of-body experiences, it was easier for him to get to a place rather than a person. Okay, this is what he's saying over here. So now, you can go to an item you can go to a place, you can go to a person in that out-of-body state. Adding fuel to the fire, years later, in an encountering a government official, I asked him about that particular site without reference to why I was interested. He related to me that it was a special federal research installation. It was being constructed just about the time I was there. Evidently, it is still not common knowledge, or at least I don't want to take that chance. Therefore, the location as indicated in my retelling is not the correct one. I still like to speculate as to what might have happened if I had kept the appointment in the out-of-body state. Item. My company had received the franchise to install a cable television system in Charlottesville, Virginia and we needed a receiving antenna site on top of a hill just outside of town. The owner of the hill was Roy, a small, balding, bright blue-eyed, energetic little man with a dry and subtle sense of humor. His face was wrinkled and tanned from many years of supervising the work in the 20,000 apple tree orchard atop the hill. As he was a true Scotsman, the negotiation was elaborately casual but came to a very reasonable and fair end, and we became friends. After lunch one Friday, he looked at me with a twinkle and asked, Do you like to play cards? 
an old familiar surge rose in me. What kind of cards? Well, he said, some people don't call it poker because we play so many wild games, but you can have a lot of fun at it. It's only 10 and 20 cent games, so you can't expect to make any money. We hold it at a different fellow's house each Friday night. And the only thing is we don't have any drinking. It's the oldest continuous poker game in the city of Charlottesville. Must have been going on steady for 70 years and that's a long time. If you would like to come tonight, I'll pick you up wherever you are about 7.30. You'll have a good time at choir practice. I looked at him blankly. Choir practice? He smiled. That's what we call it here in Virginia. Some fellows say that they are not sure whether it's legal or not. And we've heard of other games being raided for gambling. Of course, we aren't doing anything like that. I smiled. No, of course not. See you at 7.30 for choir practice. I became a regular member of choir practice. I did not attend every Friday, but I did show up at least two Fridays per month. Again, it was a welcome change from my daily work in cable television and the participants were strictly local businessmen who had, for the most part, lived in that Charlottesville area all of their lives. They also were totally unaware of any strange research or other activities I might be involved in. Even when my first book was published, they knew nothing about it, and I made no mention of it. To this day, perhaps, one or two are remotely aware of what I now do. Okay, so okay. I'd like to put in here, I've been on uh, flights to Charlottesville, I think maybe 20 times now. And let me tell you, every time whoever is sitting next to me, they're going into Charlottesville. Charlottesville is the airport for the Monroe Institute, and not one of my co-passengers who has been sitting beside me knows about the Monroe Institute. So what I'm finding is that people who are interested in this consciousness uh, expansion and exploration, they find the Monroe Institute. And the dictatomy is that any program that I've attended at the Institute, there are people from at least seven to eight countries, right? So they are flying in from all over the world but people in Charlottesville itself don't know about the Institute. So it's a real kind of a funny situation. So he's indicated it here very well, you know, that people in Charlottesville really didn't know what he was up to. The first indicator that there were unusual factors involved in card playing choir practice came about two years later when there were six of us playing a game of seven card stud. The deal began normally. My two hole cards were a three and four of clubs. Among the face-up cards dealt to me were a five and seven of clubs. The betting was quite strong. There were pairs all over the table, including a pair of aces showing on Roy's face-up cards. After I stayed in the betting, which I had no statistical right to do, trying to buy an inside straight or a flush, this final seventh card was dealt to each of us face down. I did not look at mine. Suddenly, without any question, I knew that the card dealt to me was the six of clubs. It was very strange, simply annoying. So again, okay. when we are yeah. going into these expanded states, our sense of intuition, our sense of being able to perceive things, also starts to get enhanced. Uh, there was a very funny incident. We had gone to... Uh, yeah, but if you use these things too much, then it goes, okay? So I, we had gone to uh, Bangkok and there was this monkey show going on. And they had trained the monkeys to be able to find out where the missing number was, right? So they, they were jumbling it up, jumbling it up and all that, and they were putting the missing numbers. And there were three, I think it was three times I called the right number. So the guy is telling me that you should come and do the show instead of the monkey. Okay, so mm -hmm. you could actually intuit where that num that missing number was. So that's exactly what Robert Monroe is doing over here.
Roy, I said, indicating the untouched down card. That's a six of clubs and that will make me a straight flush. And that will beat your aces full. Roy looked at the card and looked up at me with a sly grin. He had already looked at his card and he knew he had aces full. I got five that says you don't have it. That's not the six of clubs. I reached for the pile of chips and said, there it is, Roy. He smiled and matched the stack. All right, show me. I turned it over and it was the six of clubs. Roy smiled. That doesn't beat my full house. He turned over his aces full, which beat the other hands on the table. I have another five that says you don't have the three or four and four of clubs in the hole. I smiled. I don't want to take your money, Roy. A straight flush will beat my aces full. He pushed another stack out. I don't think you got it. You somehow knew there was a six of clubs there and you ought to quit while you're ahead. I smiled and said, I don't want the other five, Roy. And then I turned over the three and four in the hole, making the straight flush in clubs. He just looked at it and said, isn't that something? On the very next hand with Roy doing the dealing, the feeling I had was still there, very strong. The knowing. I didn't even look at my whole cards. Of the four cards dealt face up to me, there was a five and seven of hearts. I knew. that all. That's all I can tell you. I knew. Roy, I said. You see that five and seven of hearts, Roy nodded. He didn't have the aces this time. Well, I said, this last card you're going to deal is a six of hearts. And that will give me a straight flush in hearts. You see, I haven't seen my bottom cards yet. You notice, he nodded. Watching Roy had been the dealer. The rest of the players were watching intently, expecting me to lose. Roy was an exceptional card player. The last card was dealt to me face down and before I could pick it up, Roy said, I got another five. Say it's not the six of hearts. No, as a matter of fact, I'll make it 10. He shot a pack of chips forward. I don't want to take your money, Roy, I said, smiling. You are not taking it from me and I am not giving it to you, he said. Put it up. I did. So now turn now, over the card. He now, now, anyone, anyone who has played poker to get two straight flushes is like one in a million chances. Now turn over the card, he demanded. I did, and it was the six of hearts. He looked at me with utter astonishment. He was doing the dealing. No trickery was at all possible in his frame of reference. Moreover, I said, those two whole cards that I haven't looked at yet are the three and four of hearts. Roy looked at me. I have 20 that says that they aren't. With utmost casualness, I said, I don't want to take your money, Roy, and turned over the two whole cards. They were the three and four of hearts. Roy looked at the straight flush, the same one as before, except in hearts. Sometimes you are about the luckiest fellow I ever met. The others at the table agreed. That particular run of luck was talked about for several months. The odds against two successive straight flushes of the same denomination held by the same person in a six-handed card game are about five, seven, eight thousand to one. Hundred and eighty thousand to one. How did it happen? I don't know. How do, did I know? Very simply a sureness. I suspect a lot of high rollers have made a lot of money on such dealings and lost also because the knowing was not right. So <clears throat> there is a gentleman called Joe Gallenberger. He actually takes uh, groups to Las Vegas where they use various principles to garner information as to what the numbers are going to be. 
they roll dice they uh, play the uh, loto over there the bingo over there the numbers etc based on what their sense of knowing is uh, uh joe mcmonigan also shares shares a story where he had a group of remote viewers who used to go to las vegas on a regular basis and they used to remote view what the number is going to be and unless everyone agreed all the remote viewers in that group agreed to what the number was they never bet on it and they had a 90% win record which is like uh, it's literally impossible to get that kind of winning so this but Nikhil, of, yeah is it okay to use these uh, powers for uh, gambling so that's what i said na that if you use it too much and you use it for gambling then it becomes a problem now these people when they went, they go to las vegas they mm -hmm. are not doing it for gambling they are going to do it to test and hone their abilities to perceive so there's a very big difference in that okay, okay. and then what they do is most of the money that they win they give to charity in any case okay but this happens you know you can get to know okay are you going to win you're not going to lose you get that feel you can actually know the cards you're getting so it can be possible to do it so niket why i said this because once i think i've shared this with you i was in europe in one uh, one of these um, casinos and rajiv loves to play the roulette yeah and whatever number i was telling him he was he has his own fixed numbers and some numbers were just popping up every every roll yeah and i was telling him and wo paanch saat baar wo jab aana shuru hua everyone would wait for me uh, to tell rajiv kaise 17 pe lagao ya 31 uh, pe lagao and then after i said feeling very jittery so yeah. after five seven eight times right. i said no i'm not mere ko kuch nahi mere i just i just felt it was not right to use yeah. that but I, after that anyway it's not worked also <laughs> yeah, so after some time the propensity goes and then then that is when the drop comes you know yeah that you start losing money then. that's what he said the very clearly over here in the last line i suspect a lot of high rollers have made a lot of money on such dealings and lost because the knowing was not right so you when the ego starts kicking in that you know i have got the right number i've got the right number as soon as the ego comes in the matter gets off it goes Hemi Singh et al. With the publication of Journeys Out of the Body, we began to receive surprising inquiries, information, and cooperation from many unexpected sources. A book intended for the general was attracting interest in scientific and academic circles. Our laboratory west of Charlottesville, Virginia, opened on an entirely voluntary basis. Originally named Whistlefield Research Laboratories, this was later changed to the Monroe Institute of Applied Sciences. Using the name Monroe was not an ego factor, but simply the quickest way to clear the title officially. The applied sciences part was quite specific. We felt that the understanding of OOBEs could be achieved on a level compatible. with our western sciences and that the greatest service we could perform would be to apply any discoveries or information that we encountered so again right from the beginning the research was based on application so what are we experiencing and how do normal people apply it in their daily lives the lo laboratory consisted of a one story building designed for the purpose and included two offices a lounge and a research wing in the wing were an instrument or control room three isolation booths and a briefing room all three booths were connected independently to the control room for both physiological monitoring and the delivery of various types of audio and electromagnetic signals to stimulate a response from a volunteer subject in a booth so the booth was like soundproof light proof I mean, once you shut the door there was hardly any right light okay and it was connected so the person in the booth could speak to the person in the monitor in the monitoring room 
and the monitor could speak to the person in the booth and of course the headphones were also there for the sounds the booths themselves each contained a heated water bed thus providing a comfortable condition in total darkness they were also environmentally controlled in air temperature and acoustics a subject in the booth could be wired to transmit to the control room a wide array of physiological signals these included eight channel eeg brain wave electrical patterns emg muscle tone pulse rate and body voltage as things developed we were able to determine most of what we wanted to know simply by reading body voltage changes so the body voltage changes means the voltage that is generated by the uh, electrical frequencies generated by the body right they can be positive or negative what was seen is that when a person went out of body or was having an altered state of experience the body voltage changed the polarity changed so if it was positive it became negative if it was negative it became positive aside from visiting participants from out of town we had a local volunteer group consisting of several mds a physicist an electronic engineer several psychiatric and social service workers plus assorted friends and family most research and experiments took place at night or on weekends all of us were employed in other occupations in retrospect the immense contribution that this group gave freely was a major factor in helping the whole process get started under these new conditions and for this i will be forever grateful it took much patience and dedication to paste up with electrodes then lie hour after hour in a darkened booth and report subjective results of various tests results that could be correlated with instrument readouts in the control room to the point where a consensus could be achieved our first studies were a continuation of the sleep research begun in new york the demand for a solution to a problem brought one of our early results of significance because so much of the reported out of body states including many of my own revolved around the sleep state we still believe some answers would be found in this area however most of our subjects arrived at night after dinner and with long boring periods of being wired up with electrodes they were either too tired to stay awake in the booth or too restless to be able to relax enough to report any subtle and subjective responses it defeated our purpose to use any types of medication or drugs to control these states so we looked for a method within our own frame of preference the old truism held necessity is the mother it was through this need to help our subjects stay awake get into a borderland sleep state that we began to try utilizing sound This resulted in the discovery of frequency following response which permitted us to hold the subject in a certain state of consciousness between wakefulness and sleep for extended periods of time by introducing certain sound patterns in the subject's ears we determined that there was a similar electrical response in the brain waves of the subject by controlling that brain wave frequency we were able to help the subject relax keep him awake or put him to sleep one of our engineering participants suggested that we patent this unusual process and we received a patent on the method and technique in 1975 so what happened it was easy to put people into a relaxed state but we couldn't hold them they couldn't hold them in that awake state as well as a sleep state now if they fell asleep then nothing was happening right so they couldn't hold them there and then when they came around with binaural beats it was possible to hold the person in that level 4 if people who have done the excursion workshop will understand 
where we are talking about 4 hertz frequency, where you're not going into delta and you're not in theta. So you are being held. You're not sleeping, but you're not awake either. And that's when the magic started to happen. And of course, the Institute re received the patent for this multi-layered uh, uh, binaural beat technology in 1975. Just one second, please, Shivanga, just hold on. Okay, go ahead. By cross-referencing the various effective frequencies among subjects, we slowly began to evolve combinations of sound frequencies that created FFRs highly conducive to OOBEs and other unusual stages of consciousness among these. Of course, was a very effective means of moving into what is commonly known as a meditative state. So what started happening? These people used to come into the booths and then they were starting to play various frequencies and they were getting subjective feedback from these people who were in the booths. And then using the feedback, they came to these frequencies, which would put us into now what we are experiencing with the Monroe frequencies, right? They're taking us into these altered states of consciousness very, very easily. All of this did not come quickly. Only a few words cover hundreds of hours of putting together different sound patterns and testing for responses with subjects patiently lying in a booth as sound wobbled in their ears, slowly changing in pitch, while the technician in the control room looked for changes in the monitoring instruments. So again, what was happening? The feedback was coming from the instrument, instrumentation. The, uh, the monitor was looking at the changes in the instruments, whereas the, the, uh, the person inside the booth was giving subjective feedback. So they were correlating the subjective feedback and the, uh, uh, the information received from the monitors. Okay, just one second. Okay, go ahead. During some such sessions, our volunteer subject participants learn to report verbally on any changes in their mental or physical condition. This became a very important ability to speak and perceive when the normal pattern would be to lose consciousness or be asleep. Now this became important. You're in that meditative state and you had, you used to have a mic over there and you were reporting. So you're going into a very deep state, but you've developed the ability to speak about your state of consciousness to the monitor. In fact, in many of the programs at the Institute, they used to give these recorders, these tape recorders to people where they could actually record their experience while they were having it. So people actually used to press the record button and press the pause button when they were having those uh, experiences. Now, of course, they don't do that. You can do it on your phone also, but now it's not done so much. But I have attended when I attended the gateway uh, guidelines program, they actually gave us a tape recorder to record our experiences. One of the first solid points of identification was a state that we began to label focus 10. There was no particular significance to the number 10 and I am not sure where it originated. Also, we wanted to be sure it was not confused with other forms of consciousness. Therefore, it became simply 10. We were able to identify the state very specifically and to return to it again and again with our subjects. Easily defined, focus 10 is a state where the mind is awake and the body asleep. All the physiological responses are those of one in light or deep sleep. However, the brainwave patterns are different. The EEGs show a mix of waves ordinarily associated with sleep, light and deep, and overlying beta signals, wakefulness. So now what now, happened? Now most of you or a lot of people experience the focus 10 state of consciousness, right? So what is it saying over here? The normal state, when you take an EEG of a person who's sleeping, will normally have, will not have beta frequencies in that brainwave pattern. 
but when you are in the focus tense state you have along with delta theta and alpha frequencies you have the beta frequencies also so what does that mean is that you are in a state of sleep but you are also awake that's why the f10 or the focus tense state of consciousness is labeled mind awake body asleep right so the body is sleeping but the mind is awake that's what the frequency patterns allows us to do now most of the time we are connected with our body system right so a lot of our conscious awareness is focused on the body but now your body is asleep so your mind is free to roam that's why f10 becomes a very powerful state of consciousness and you experience a freedom that uh, in in that focused tense state that you normally do not experience as far as your mind is concerned in the normal waking state of consciousness gradually they developed a very special group a total of some eight subjects completely familiar with the focus tense state verbal communication in focus tense through the microphone headphone system became as normal as if we were sitting across from one another in a conference room we could tell easily from the instrument readout when they were and when they were not in focus tense it could not be imagined or faked even if there had been any remote desire to do so there were many times of course when they were unable to get into the focused tense state because of external pressures and stresses in their daily lives that they could not abandon easily in such cases they simply reported that they could not do it that night or cancel the appointment this saved much time and effort so so this group of 10 people they ultimately were called the explorers with the constant stream of visitors we began to determine that others totally untrained could be assisted into focus 10 without a great deal of trouble the process of learning to communicate verbally would take much longer to see how far this would go we sent a tape of the composite sing- signal to a psychiatrist friend in kansas in an experiment he tested it on four completely naive subjects and with no suggestion as to what to expect he reported that one of the four subjects quit the test because he found that he was bouncing against the ceiling of the room looking down at his physical body so this guy had an obe right just by hearing the focus then signals and yeah if you're not used to it and you don't have information about it it can really freak you out a next step came as an interesting proposition with the body asleep that is the physical senses turned off or reduced why not develop frequencies that would enhance perceiving by means other than the five physical senses with the insertion of higher frequency beta signals our subjects began to find much more than the usual blackness first came light and color patterns seen visually in the blacked out booth with eyes either closed or open next came sounds heard in the head not a part of the synthesized sounds but voices music sometimes loud explosions that startled the subject completely out of focus then something that has still to be explained so now you you going into that states and previously in the beginning everyone was just seeing black okay everyone was just black nothing was happening and then when they started inserting other frequencies color started coming up so the audience you know we are sensing not with the five physical senses but we are sensing with the expanded senses so things which were not on the track started getting heard colors which were not there it was a totally dark booth and they could start seeing colors and all those things started to gently start happening these phenomena were gradually perceived in a pattern as somewhat of a band preceding a change into the outer body experience there were also preliminary physiological responses lowering of blood pressure and pulse 
slight temperature drop, loss of muscle tone. Subjectively, there were reports of a heaviness in the physical body, sometimes catalepsy and a strong sense of heat followed by coolness. As the induction of the OOBE state was examined further, one key element did repeat consistently. Subjects began to locate within their non-physical perception a pinpoint of light. When the subject learned to move in the direction of the light until it became larger and larger and then move through it, the OOBE state was achieved. In slow motion, it felt as if one were going through a tunnel to get to the light. A classic description that has been brought forth by many who perform the OOBE inadvertently or in a near-death situation. So this is something that we have seen. Blood pressure gets monitored. There was this lady, I've mentioned the story before, that she was, she was pregnant and she was suffering from high blood pressure. And we, we, were, we had just started the meditations in Alipur at that time. And she happened to attend one of our sessions and then go to the doctor. After the session, when she went to the doctor, her blood pressure was normal. So the doctor asked her, what have you done? And she, he didn't ask her what you have done, right? Now, the next time he visited, she was to visit the doctor. Again, she happened to attend the meditation and go. Again, her blood pressure was normal. So we have seen that the hemisync meditations definitely have a physiological effect. In the excursion workshop, we started even taking the blood sample of people. We've got blood samples of people before the workshop and after the workshop. In the Calcutta Center, we have the system to do that. We use a dark field microscope to actually see the red blood cells. And we have consistently found that the red blood cells, generally when they, when, when they are not, the energy is not there, they start stacking up. It's called ruling. And after the excursion, the blood opens up. This is we've seen consistently. So naturally, the blood has started to move. The blood pressure definitely gets monitored. Okay. And of course, we've in all the workshops, we always tell people to keep a blanket because you can feel cold and suddenly you may start feeling hot, which is again something which is mentioned over here. One new development was the key that opened many things for us. We now call it the hemisync process. Science has long known that your brain is divided into two halves or hemispheres, but only in recent years has it been discovered that these two halves are entirely different in the functions they perform. There is still controversy about the theory as to details. Most of the time we think only with our left brain, when we use our right brain, it is primarily to support the action of the left. Otherwise, we do our best to ignore it. In function, the nerve signals from these brain halves act in an X crossover. The left brain controls the right side of the body and the right brain controls the left. We are primarily a right-handed civilization dominated by our left brains. Only in the last 50 years have left-handers been accepted as equals. In many ways, we still discriminate against left-handers. Did you know that a pair of scissors is a right-handed tool? So, so, all of us know we've got now, at, at, in the workshop we talk about the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. Now, the left side is more logical. The right side is more intuitive, right? Now, we have focused so much on, on logic after the Industrial Revolution that the intuitive side of things has taken a backseat. So we, I mean, you know, in the Industrial Age, when, they, when the Industrial Age was starting, the witches were hunted and, you know, all those things were done at that time. So the left side, has, the right side has not got the stimulation that was required. And literally everything is based on right-handed people because most people are right-handed. We use the left brain to talk and read, to do mathematics, to reason deductively, to remember detail, to measure time, among many other facets. 
the source of logical, rational thought. It knows nothing else. Our right brain is the originator of ideas, spatial sense, intuition, music, emotion, and probably much more than we now realize. It is timeless, apparently with a language all its own. So, so the right brain gets a guess thought. It, it knows stuff. It is the connection with the higher states, right? The logic is more available with the conscious, the small mind. What is available in this 3D environment, that's what the left brain is normally looking at, right? It is mostly in the past or the future. The, the right side is in the present. But the left, if you see ourselves, you know, are we in the present or are we spending more time in the past and the future? I'm sure most of you will say that we spend, if you actually analyze it, you're spending more time in the past or the future, not in the present. Right, but the right brain is more operating in the present. So, Niketbya, usually all left-handers yeah. are considered to be extra smart or very artistic or exactly. Uh, so, so, extra smart, matlab kya hua? They are more intuitive. More intuitive. They are, yeah. they are more artistic because art, yeah. art is art has no logic, right? Yeah, yeah. Music yeah. has no logic, so it's True. all right brain stuff. True. Whereas we are more logical, most of us. So mm. we are using the left brain more. Yeah. Well, left-handed people use the right brain more. One of the best descriptions given to illustrate the difference is with a reel of movie film. To determine the content, the left brain will put it on a projector, show the movie on a screen and thus be informed. The right brain will pick up the roll of film, hold it for a moment, then put it down and say, oh, I understand. Have you got that? So now many times what happens? That's why they used to tell, you know, that keep the book. If you're going to study something, keep it under your pillow. Right? The right brain gets a guest all. You hold something in your hand and you know what it is. So most of the intuitive sciences like psychometry, Aura reading, aura analysis, astrology. They are, yes, astrology, of course, has a logical side. But let me tell you, all astrologers are intuitive. If they are good at astrology, they have to be intuitive. Because, because it is physically impossible to know the millions of combinations that can occur. And what is the result of these millions of combinations? It's impossible for an astrologer to deduce it logically, right? It becomes very, very difficult. So intuition plays a very, very major part in all these predictive sciences, artists, music, the right side of the brain has to function. Whereas most of us, we are not using the right side of the brain. And that's the beauty of the hemisync process. It allows us to start connecting to the right side of the brain. That's why Himlata Bua was saying that after the program yesterday, there is stillness in our mind, right? The logical mind is always working, cut, 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 cut. It's constantly working. But when we go into a whole brain state, we can access that stillness. We can connect to a deeper state of our own consciousness. And that is when the magic starts to happen. And that's the beauty of the hemisync process. Ridiculous. That's your left brain's reaction as you use it to read these words. It simply doesn't compute by left brain standards. Basically, we are a half brain society. Virtually everything we consider valuable is operated or controlled by our dominant left brain. Even if it originates in the right brain, such as an idea or music, the left brain takes over and puts it to use. How did we get this way? No one is absolutely sure but one of the better guesses is that the left brain dominance came about because of a basic need to survive in a physical world. Through thousands of years, our forebears added to left brainism because that was the way to get things done. Our entire system, books, schools, colleges, and universities, industry, political structures, churches is fundamentally left brained in learning application and operation. We have generally regarded right brain thinking with 
amuse tolerance, suspicion, disgust, irritation, distrust, and awe. Then why bother? Why not stay half brain and let it go at that? Who needs the right brain? Okay, I think we can stop here.